Hello, my name is Nicholas Trailer, Executive Director of the Richmond Rent Program. This presentation is on how to increase rents in Richmond for controlled rental units. Now, before we get into the weeds of how to increase rents in Richmond, let's do a quick overview of the Fair Rent, Just Cost for Eviction, and Homeowner Protection Ordinance, or Rent Ordinance in short. The rent ordinance has two main components, rent control and eviction protections. Rents are controlled or regulated in two ways. First is an annual cost of living rent increase, which is tied to 100% of the consumer price index or the inflationary rate for the Bay Area. This increase, which occurs every September 1st, is also known as the annual general adjustment AGA. Rents are also regulated through the rent adjustment petition process. The rent adjustment petition process allows landlords and tenants to file rent increase or rent decrease petitions. The other main component of the rent ordinance are its eviction protections or the requirement to have just cause to terminate a tenancy. Now tied to the rent ordinance is the Richmond Relocation Ordinance, which requires the payment of either temporary or permanent relocation assistance to tenants who were evicted for a no fault just cause, such as owner move-in or withdrawal from the rental market. The Richmond Rent Program functions to administer and enforce both the rent control and just cause for eviction sections of the rent ordinance. So let's jump straight into how to increase rents in Richmond for controlled rental units. Now, please note that a controlled rental unit is a multi-unit property that was built with permits prior to February 1st of 1995. Single family homes, in other words, a single dwelling um, on a parcel, condominiums, and post February 1st, 1995 construction with permits are exempt from the, from the rent control provisions of the Richmond Rent Ordinance. However, they are still covered by the requirement to have just cause to terminate a tenancy. Now there are three ways to lawfully raise rents in Richmond. Now, the first is through the resetting of rents to market in between tenancies. The second is through the annual cost of living increase known as the annual general adjustment. And the final way to raise rents is through the rent adjustment petition process, which allows landlords to petition to increase their rent to maintain the net operating income they achieved in the base year or the year prior to rent control being considered as a policy in Richmond. Landlords may also petition to increase the rents due to an increase in occupants or an increase in space or services uh, upon the agreement of the tenant. <clears throat> so now let's look at um, raising rents to market uh, in between tenancies uh, or through what's known as vacancy decontrol. So rents can be reset or raised to market when a tenancy ends due to a voluntary vacancy or due to a, an at-fault eviction, and then a new tenancy begins. Rents can also be reset to market when all of the original occupants or leaseholders have vacated and only holdover subtenants remain in the unit. And uh, rents can also be raised uh, if the tenant no longer lives in the unit as their primary residence. Um, in other words, the original tenant is um, permanently subletting or using the unit as a vacation or second home. Actually, let's go back uh, to this again. And this is very important. Um, so, Whenever a new tenancy starts for a controlled rental unit, or when there's a complete turnover of original occupants, 
Landlords must file a tenancy registration form with the rent program. And on this next page, we're going to look at that form. <clears throat> so the tenancy registration form uh, tracks uh, the rent paid by the tenant at the onset of the tenancy, uh, the number of tenants um, in the household, uh, and the housing services associated with the tenancy. Now, this information is key uh, for both landlords and tenants um, in terms of being able to track the maximum allowable rent uh, for uh, the tenancies in question. Uh, and it helps both landlords and tenants avoid disputes over what the actual lawful rent level is. So let's uh, examine in a bit more detail how vacancy deed control works in California. Now cities in California with rent uh, ordinances operate under the Costa-Hawkins Rental Act, which allows for rents to be decontrolled uh, or reset in between tenancies and then recontrolled after the new tenancy starts. So for example, we have a tenancy that um, started in March of 2018, where the landlord and tenant agreed to a uh, rent of $1,000. And we call this, uh, Started the tenancy uh, a recontrol event because previously uh, there had been another tenancy that ended, uh, which gave the landlord an opportunity to uh, reset the rent. But now that $1,000 rent is being recontrolled. So uh, recontrol means that the landlord uh, may increase the rent, uh, but is limited to, uh, to the to 100% of the consumer price index. And so for example, in 2019, that amount or that percentage was 3.5%, raising the rent up to 1,035. And in 2020, uh, the landlord uh, was allowed to increase the rent by 2.9%, uh, which led to the increase of uh, the rent uh, increasing to 1,065. Now in 2021, the tenant that moved in in, two, in March of 2018 decides to move out and a new tenancy starts um, either because the tenant moved out, the previous tenant moved out or all of the original occupants have vacated. And this is a, a decontrol event where the landlord has the ability to reset the rent to market. And in this particular scenario, the landlord resets the rent to uh, $1,350 uh, for the new tenants. And of course, this rent of $1,350 is then recontrolled again, uh, and the landlord can take um, the next uh, annual general adjustment that they qualify for. So I'm gonna just go through this real quick. This is um, a little bit more about raising rents through the annual general adjustment. So what is the AGA and how is it calculated? As I mentioned before, um, landlords of controlled rental units in Richmond are allowed to take an annual cost of living rent increase. And that rent increase is based on 100% of the consumer price index or inflationary rate for the Bay Area. Again, this is known as the Annual General Adjustment or AGA. So when can the AGA be taken? Generally, the AGA can be taken on September 1st of each year after the landlord provides proper legal notice. Now, when a new tenancy starts, um, when can the first AGA be taken? So to qualify for the first AGA increase, the tenancy had to have started prior to September 1st of the previous year. Now, one question that we often get is, can landlords bank or defer AGA increases 
and then take them in later years? The answer is yes. However, landlords are limited to taking the current year's AGA increase plus up to 5% uh, from the previously deferred AGAs. Now, if the AGA is over 5%, as is the case in 2022, then no banking of previous year's AGAs is allowed. Now, anytime um, a landlord serves a tenant with a notice of rent increase, <clears throat> they are um, bound by state law in terms of how much notice they are, they are required to get. So under Civil Code 827, any <clears throat> uh, notice to increase the rent by 10% or less during a 12 month period requires a 30 day written notice. If the increase is more than 10% during a, any 12 month period, a 90 day written notice of rent increase is required. <clears throat> so now let's talk about the connection between the annual general adjustment and what's known as the maximum allowable rent or MAR. So the MAR is the maximum rent that can be charged for a controlled rental unit. Some people like to call it the rent ceiling. So the maximum allowable rent is calculated by taking the base rent or the uh, rent that the tenant paid at the onset of the tenancy plus each year's annual general adjustment in addition to any individual rent adjustments that are approved through the uh, rent adjustment petition process. Now, a rent increase, it's very important to know a rent increase cannot exceed the maximum allowable rent, but it can be less. Um, so even if the maximum rent is not charged, the maximum allowable rent remains the same, and the landlord may choose to raise the rent to the maximum in accordance with state law and the rent board's banking regulation that I just mentioned. <clears throat> so this slide illustrates uh, how the maximum allowable rent increases each year due to the annual general adjustment. Note that each annual general adjustment rent increase is based on the current rent that was paid, and therefore the combined increase from the base rent is greater than the sum of the AGA. So let's say your base rent is $1,000. <clears> um, uh, if the landlord applied the 2016 AGA of 3%, uh, that would be um, an increase of $30. Um, and then in September of 2017, the landlord could apply the uh, 2017 AGA of 3.4%, which results in the maximum allowable rent raising to 1,065 and two cents. And you can see in subsequent years how it works, there is a compounding of the uh, annual general adjustment and maximum allowable rent. Uh, and that continues uh, throughout time, as long as the tenancy is in place. <clears throat> so uh, this slide uh, shows you all of the annual general adjustments uh, that landlords um, have been able to uh, take since the inception of the rent program. Um, you can see that <clears throat> the annual gen general adjustments have generally um, been around 3%. Um, and in this particular year, in 2022, you can see that um, due to um, increase uh, in inflation, uh, the annual general adjustment has gone up to 5.2%. And because the annual general adjustment is over 5%, um, landlords are prohibited from banking previous year's uh, increases that they did. 
So um, <clears throat> taking an AGA increase um, is not necessarily an automatic thing. In order to qualify to take the annual general adjustment, a landlord must be in compliance with uh, various aspects of the rent ordinance and associated regulations. So for example, um, there are some administrative requirements that the landlord must meet. Uh, of those, um, those requirements, the landlord is, uh, must submit a property enrollment form, tenancy registration forms, pay the rental housing fee, and uh, refund any overcharges uh, that may exist uh, between the landlord and the tenant. Um, <clears throat> there are also uh, rent increase noticing requirements. So in order to um, take the annual general adjustment and for the increase to be valid, um, the landlord must provide the rent program with a copy of the rent increase notice, uh, along with the proof of service within 10 business days of having served tenant. And just a quick reminder, um, only properties that are subject, subject to the rent control provisions of the rent ordinance are required to file the rent increase notices with the rent program. So if you own a single family home, condominium, uh, for example, uh, you're not required to uh, submit the rent increase notice uh, to the rent program in order for the increase to be valid. <clears throat> so this is a screenshot of um, our rent increase page. Uh, you can go to this page and click on file a notice of rent increase with the rent board. And um, it will take you to a, a portal uh, where you can submit your rent increase notice that you served on the tenant. And I'm going to um, quickly uh, illustrate to folks um, how that can work. So if you go to our website, and you go to the rent increase uh, tab here. Uh, you can also go to <clears throat> one of these uh, boxes here. So file a rent increase notice, click on that. Gives you some general information about this year's uh, allowable rent increase. It also, there are also uh, sample uh, rent increase forms as well as a maximum allowable rent calculator and the rent program brochure in both English and Spanish. Uh, the brochure, when landlords uh, serve tenants, uh, a notice of rent increase, uh, they're required to include the rent program brochure. Now, uh, there are two ways to submit rent increase notices. The first is by uh, accessing uh, our um, online sub 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 uh, submission program or submittal program. Um, the other is to mail a hard copy in to the rent program office. So let's click on this button and it will take you to our form center um, <clears throat> where you would enter the APN, the main address for the rental property, uh, the rest of the information about the property, and then include the tenants' names, unit numbers, uh, the rent, the current rent they're paying, and the, the new rent based on the rent increase notice. And that would be um, something that you could do for um, multiple units as well. And there's a, a, an ability to um, upload uh, your rent increase notices, the actual notices, copies of those notices uh, to this portal so that there is a record that you uh, properly submitted the notice to the rent program. All right, let's now uh, pivot to uh, filing a rent increase petition. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> so there are um, several types of petitions that a landlord may file to increase the rent. Um, there's the fair return, or also known as the MNOI, or maintenance of net operating income petition. And this is a petition to increase the maximum allowable rent due to increases in net operating costs. And I'll get into more detail about the fair return petition in subsequent slides. There is also a petition to increase the rent due to an increase in occupants. And <clears throat> with this petition, a landlord <clears throat> may petition uh, the rent board to increase the maximum allowable rent uh, due to an increase in the number of occupants allowed. So for example, if the tenancy originally only allowed for two tenants, um, and then subsequently, some years later, uh, a tenant adds two new people. Uh, uh, and uh, now there are four people living in this rental unit. Um, the landlord may uh, be able to receive up to 15% uh, in terms of a rent increase for each additional occupant above the base occupancy level. Now, it's important to, to note that direct family members, um, meaning mother, father, son, daughter, spouse, registered domestic partner, grandparents, and grandchildren, uh, cannot be included uh, in terms of uh, an increase in occupants. Uh, so you cannot, if, if a mother moves in with, um, with a family and there's an additional occupant, uh, the landlord would not qualify for a rent increase because the mother moved in. And then there is the petition to increase the rent uh, due to an increase in space for services. Now, this, a good example of this type of petition is uh, when, let's say, a tenant uh, wishes to, uh, informs the landlord that they would like to, the landlord to install a dishwasher. Um, and the landlord says, I can do that, uh, but, you know, let's agree to a reasonable rent increase. Well, if the uh, rent increase um, due to the addition of this dishwasher is commercially reasonable, and that's something that the hearing examiner would determine, um, and the tenant signs off or agrees to the increase, um, the, um, in all likelihood, uh, the increase would be granted. <clears throat> and just to bear in mind that um, any rent increase resulting from some agreement with the tenant uh, related to an increase in space or services does require authorization by the board. And that must be done and it, that must be achieved uh, by filing the um, petition, the increase in space or services uh, petition. And there are some other landlord rent adjustment petitions as well. Um, there's the petition to increase the security deposit. Uh, that's um, where a, a landlord requests an increase um, in the security deposit. And, and bear in mind that the security deposit is considered rent. So therefore it does have to go through a process um, in terms of uh, uh, receiving uh, authorization for that increase through the board. Um, so this petition uh, increases the security deposit due to the addition of a non-service uh, assistance or emotional support animal where pets uh, are prohibited or limited under the original lease. And uh, there are um, there is a maximum that you can request in terms of additional security deposit. Uh, and that maximum is tied to the maximum that you can collect for a security deposit under state law. And that amount is two times the monthly rent um, for unfurnished units and three times the monthly rent for furnished units. 
Uh, there's also a petition to determine initial rent. And that petition is to increase or maintain the maximum allowable rent. Um, and it's based on whether or not uh, the last original occupant has vacated or no longer lives or continues to live in the rental unit as their primary residence. So this is a case where you have a tenant who, you know, uh, who has a rent controlled unit and the landlord suspects that they are not living there as their primary residence anymore. Maybe they're using it as a second home or renting it out, uh, subletting it. Um, in some cases, the tenant may even put it on Airbnb uh, to try to make a little bit of money. Uh, but in any case, um, a tenant is only, um, uh, their, their rent controlled level, the, the amount that they pay is tied to their whether or not they live there as their uh, live live in the unit as their primary residence, and if they don't, they they the unit can be decontrolled and the landlord can reset the rent. And then there is the petition to allow a landlord to recover previously denied annual general adjustment rent increases. Um, so AGA increases are uh, may be denied due to. Uh, housing, health, or safety code violations, uh, failure on the part of the landlord to pay the rental housing fee, or failure by the landlord to comply with a hearing examiner or rent board's order. So we're going to do a quick overview <coughs> of the rent adjustment petition process. So the rent ordinance um, as I mentioned before, allows for rents to be regulated and adjusted through the rent adjustment petition process. This is a process overseen by a hearing examiner. Uh, you should think of the hearing examiner as a judge um, and the process is uh, like court, but less formal as it is uh, an administrative process uh, that is performed and completed through the rent program and its staff. Now, Landlords and or tenants subject to the rent control provisions of the rent ordinance are allowed to file a petition requesting a down, downward or upward adjustment in rent. After reviewing documents um, submitted as part of the petition and listening to testimony, uh, the hearing examiner may order an adjustment to the rent if the petitioner has proven their case by a preponderance of evidence. In other words, uh, if they have more than 50, if it's more than 50% likely based on the evidence submitted and testimony that their claim is valid and true. So the steps for filing a petition are to start with um, contacting um, a rent program services analyst to discuss your case and learn about your rights under the rent ordinance and rent regulations. Um, anyone who's interested in filing a petition should really consult with a rent program services analyst. And, and that's as easy as calling 510-234-RENT uh, or 7368. And that should be done prior to filing a petition uh, to ensure correct filing and to understand how the rent adjustment petition process works. Our rent program services analysts uh, are available Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to noon and 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. The next step is to complete the landlord um, or the tenants filing the petition, um, the, the landlord uh, or tenant packet. This form uh, must be completed and filed in order for the petition to be deemed complete. And then uh, the next step is um, completing the appropriate attachments. Um, tenants or landlords can petition for multiple grounds at the same time. So for example, a landlord could petition for an increase in services, uh, an increase in security deposit, um, and maybe an increase in number of occupants um, in the unit. And they, that could be done concurrently. 
step number four uh, is to include your documentation or evidence that supports the petition claim. So when filing a petition, uh, the petitioner should submit the lease, um, letters associated with the issue, emails, text, photos, videos, inspection reports, and any other documentation to support the grounds for their rent adjustment. And remember that the hearing examiner's rent adjustment decision is based on a preponderance of evidence. So this step is very important because uh, whichever party uh, provides the preponderance of evidence to support their claim, they're more likely to um, have the decision go in their favor. Now, step five requires the completion uh, and a submission of a proof of service to the rent program and all parties. Uh, an important part of the petition process is the requirement that a petitioner complete and submit a proof of service along with the completed petition packet, which again includes the forms, attachments, and documentation. Um, when submitting a proof of service, the petitioner is declaring under penalty of perjury that they will serve a copy of the petition that was submitted to the rent program um, to the other party. And then step six uh, requires uh, the filing of the original copy uh, of the petition along with its attachments and documentation, either by mail uh, to the City of Richmond Rent Program Hearings Unit, 440 Civic Center Plaza, Suite 200, Richmond, California, 94804, or by email, attention hearings unit at rent at ci.richmond.ca.us. So I just wanna go over a little bit more of uh, what a completed landlord petition looks like. Um, so it starts with uh, the landlord petition packet for individual rent adjustment. Now, this is the general um, uh, petition form that all landlords must fill out. Uh, it provides basic information about the landlord and their claim and the property. Uh, and then along with the main packet, uh, the petition packet, um, the uh, landlord would submit one of the attachments or more than one of the attachments if, um, if they have multiple claims. Um, so their attachment A, for example, is the maintenance of net operating income or fair return petition, uh, B, increase in number of occupants, so on and so forth. And then um, finally, um, uh, a completed packet for a landlord uh, requires uh, the proof of service. Again, that is uh, signing off by the landlord that they will serve a copy of what they're submitting to the rent program. Um, to the tenant or tenants in question. And finally, uh, any supporting documentation to back up um, uh, the landlord's claim or as to why they should receive a rent increase, uh, that should be uh, uh, attached or submitted along with the um, landlord petition packet and attachment and proof of service. Now, after a petition is filed, um, the, uh, there are certain things that occur, and we're going to go over that real quick. <clears throat> so once the petition is received by the rent program and is reviewed for, complete, for completion, um, the other party is given the opportunity to object to the petition within 21 calendar days um, of the mailing of the notice. Now, after the 21-day objection deadline is over, a settlement conference and hearing notice will be scheduled. Um, and that notice will be sent to all parties. Uh, either party can request a continuance in writing. Now, after the hearing, a decision is rendered 
and that decision can be appealed by either party within 30 days or 35 days if mailed. Um, and it's 35 days uh, from the date of the decision. So um, let's talk about what to expect if uh, you file a petition and you have a hearing. So before the hearing starts, each party must introduce themselves to the record. The hearing examiner may not discuss the case unless all parties are present. Now the settlement conference and hearing can only proceed if all parties are participating unless there is a complete failure to appear by the responding party, in which case the hearing can still go forward. Now, a failure to appear by the petitioning party will generally result in a dismissal of the petition. Now, the next step is uh, when the hearing examiner uh, discusses a possible settlement with the party. Now, each petition and corresponding objections and present openings for possible settlement. And prior to each hearing, there is a combined settlement conference where the two parties can uh, attempt to settle the issue before uh, the, uh, it goes to a full hearing where it is recorded and both parties are under oath. Um, the next step is, uh, evidence. Now, the parties may have submitted evidence with their petition um, or objections. Uh, any other documentation, such as invoices, photographs, or text messages um, uh, to be reviewed during the hearing in the form of exhibits. An exhibit is a document designated to support or contest a specific claim, must be provided electronic, electronically to the REN program and all parties uh, must be served, uh, must, must receive uh, those exhibits or documentation no less than two business days before the hearing. <clears throat> the next step is when the hearing examiner begins to um, cross-examine um, the, uh, the, the parties. So the hearing examiner will ask questions to the parties present about their uh, pre-filled uh, or pre-filed uh, testimony um, or evidence. And that's done to better understand the party's position in the case or to ask questions to challenge the credibility or accuracy of the claims. The next step is the rebuttal phase. Um, and the hearing examiner has discretion um, uh, to allow each party to have an opportunity to contradict evidence presented by the other party. So you may present evidence, for example, texts, photos, documents, et cetera, uh, in rebuttal uh, to disprove or rebut new evidence presented by the other side. And then the uh, part six are the closing arguments. And here the hearing examiner will close the hearing uh, or decide to keep the case open for further analysis uh, to make a decision. Um, a hearing uh, written decision uh, will be sent to all parties after the hearing pursuant to Rent Board Regulation 837. The decision is likely to be sent within a few weeks, uh, in some cases a few months after the hearing. Now, after the hearing examiner uh, sends both parties the decision, any party uh, or both parties uh, have the right to appeal the decision of the rent program hearing examiner. And that must be done within 35 calendar days uh, after the date of mailing of the hearing examiner's decision. Now on appeal, uh, the decision is reviewed by a five member rent board who act as quasi-judicial judges. The board um, may choose to affirm, reverse, or modify the decision of the hearing examiner. Now, filing a timely appeal 
does put on hold the finality of the hearing examiner's decision. So it cannot be um, enforced uh, until the final decision of the board. <clears throat> now, um, filing a late appeal is possible, but you must state the reason in writing and include it with your appeal. The filing of an untimely appeal does not stay any portion of the hearing examiner's decision. Now, after a timely appeal is filed, the appellant and respondent are informed by the rent program uh, regarding the requirement to appear and participate at the appeal hearing. Any party who wishes to appeal the rent board's decision can also seek judicial review by filing a writ of administrative mandamus with superior court within the jurisdiction. And essentially a writ of um, administrative mandamus is a, uh, as a lawsuit. Um, and so they may go to superior court to challenge the, hear, uh, the rent board's decision. <clears throat> now we're gonna be talking about um, filing a fair return or maintenance of net operating income uh, petition. So our first introduction to a landlord's right to a fair return comes in actually in the very first part of the rent ordinance and it's captured in the rent ordinance's purpose statement. So as stated in this slide, uh, the purpose of the rent ordinance is to promote neighborhood and community stability, healthy housing and affordability for renters in the city of Richmond by controlling excessive rent increases and arbitrary evictions to the greatest extent allowable under California law, while ensuring landlords a fair and reasonable return on their investment and protecting homeowners. There is going to be um, an interplay between a landlord's right to a fair return and the board's duties to control rents and arbitrary evictions to the greatest extent allowable by law. <clears throat> the rent board's ability to control rents is um, circumscribed by constitutional principles. Um, as it relates to rent control jurisdiction, uh, jurisdictions, these principles are satisfied so long as the price controls are not confiscatory. In other words, they do not deprive the investor of a fair return on their investment. Now that's a fancy way of describing the tension that exists in the purpose statement I just read. Um, so in other words, uh, the rent can only be controlled to a certain point. And that threshold is known as fair return. Knowing where that threshold is, is really the, the theme of um, this discussion. So let's do a, a more in-depth uh, overview of the maintenance of net operating income process. But let's first look at the rationale between, behind uh, MNOI. So MNOI or maintenance of net operating income defines fair return on investment uh, based on a presumption. And we're gonna talk about that presumption right now. The MNOI presumes that the net operating income received by the landlord in the base year provided the landlord a fair return on investment. Richmond Rent Board Regulations um, uh, 905A1 um, codify that uh, presumption. Thus, uh, so long as the net operating income and the base year is maintained and adjusted for 100% of inflation, it is presumed that the landlord is receiving a fair return on their investment uh, in the base year. The base year um, uh, is chosen um, on the theory that rents charged 
prior to the discussions and enactment of rent control provide an accurate approximation of rents that would be paid in an open market. So taken together, MNOI presumes that the rents landlords chose to charge in a year free from the idea of rent control provided landlords a fair return on their investment as the rents that were charged were based on general market conditions and not the upward pressure that policy discussions around rent control may have had on the market. Now in Richmond, uh, the base year is 2015. <clears throat> so to ensure that year over year, a landlord is maintaining a fair return the rent ordinance permits um, a landlord to take a rent increase that is equivalent to 100% of the inflation rate. This increase, as we've mentioned before, is known as the Annual General uh, um, Adjustment or AGA. The AGA essentially adjusts the landlord's net operating income by inflation to ensure that dollars on investment are not lost over time. In this manner, the AGA serves to maintain the landlord's net operating income and fair return on investment. Now, despite this device, there, are, there may be occasions where landlords are still not receiving a fair return on their investment. <clears throat> As mentioned, um, maintaining the net operating income in the base year is essential to a landlord obtaining a fair return on their investment. To determine whether a landlord has maintained the net operating income in the base year, one must first understand the meaning of net, oper net operating income and determine the net operating income in the base year. Net operating income is the difference between operating expenses and gross rental income in a given year. So net operating income is determined by taking the total expenses in a given year and subtracting it from the gross income received in that same year. For the purposes of MNOI, certain expenses and income are excluded from the MNOI analysis. For, for instance, the rent ordinance prohibits landlords from charging for utilities that are not individually metered. And consequently, um, uh, Richmond Rent Board regulations governing the MNOI process preclude landlords from including income generated from submetered utility charges. The net operating income in the base year is the starting point from which one determines whether a landlord is obtaining a fair return on their investment. Once one determines the net operating income in the base year, that income must be compared to the net operating income in the current year. Now the current year is the calendar year preceding the year the landlord files the MNOI petition. Recall that fair return concerns itself with the financial integrity of the whole property. To understand the financial integrity of the property as a whole, one must uh, be able to evaluate the total income and expenses in a given calendar year. The current year looks the preceding year because all of the expenses and income in that, of that property as a whole have been incurred already. Additionally, it allows for a consistent 12-month comparison with the static base year operating income. Consequently, if a landlord files an MNOI petition in 2021, the current year will be 2020. After ascertaining the net operating income in the base year and the current year, the two figures must be compared. However, prior to comparing the figures, the base 
net operating income must be adjusted by inflation. In other words, the consumer price index that has occurred from the base year to the current year. In other words, um, $1 in 2015 is not the same as $1 in the preceding years because inflation impacts the value of goods and thus the value of the dollar. Therefore, to ensure a sound comparison in the value of net operating income, the dollars in 2015 must be adjusted by the inflation that occurred between 2015 and the current year. Once the net operating income in the base year has been adjusted by inflation, the newly adjusted base net operating income is referred to as the fair net operating income. Subsequently, the fair net operating income is compared to the current net operating income, current year net operating income. If the net operating income in the current year is less than the fair net operating income, the landlord is not receiving a fair return and is entitled to an income adjustment through the form of a rent increase. This rent increase is equivalent to the difference between the current year net operating income and fair net operating income divided by the total a number of units and that's spread over a 12 month period. So we're gonna do a more basic example of um, an MNOI calculation now. So this is Maria and she owns a four unit complex. In this scenario, each unit pays $1,400 per unit. <clears throat> so uh, the maintenance of net operating income calculations must begin by examining uh, the base year net operating income and operating expenses. So let's look at um, Maria's base year net operating income and operating expenses. First, let's look at her um, operating expenses and what she can include. The expenses that Maria can include are reasonable costs of operation, maintenance of the rental unit, property taxes, insurance, utility costs, management expenses, licenses, uh, registration, and other public fees, including the rental housing fee, um, landlord performed labor, and legal expenses. Now, Maria cannot include debt service costs or costs for obtaining financing, mortgage payments or principal, any penalties, fees, or interest assessed for violation of, of the ordinance or law, land lease expenses, political contributions, depreciation, any expenses for which the landlord has already been reimbursed, and unreasonable increases in expenses since the base year. So if Maria were filing the petition, she would um, look at her uh, base year expenses and income and compare them on this chart. You can see the list of all the items that she can claim um, as expenses. Now in Maria's case, her total annual operating expenses equal $20,160. So uh, the operating income is usually the total amount of rent collected minus expenses. Uh, for the purpose of the MNOI analysis, we will be using the annual rental so the annual net operating income is equivalent to the total annual rent collected minus operating expenses. In Maria's case, 
Her annual revenue uh, is four, time, uh, four units, four rental units times $1,400 times 12 months or 67,200. In this uh, scenario, Maria's annual expenses are 30% of her revenue. Uh, that equals $20,160. So when you subtract 67,200, uh, excuse me, 20,160 from 67,200, you get the base year net operating income of $47,040. So the NOI or net operating income for Maria in the base year is 47,040. Now let's fast forward uh, to 2021. Um, and in this scenario, the rent has increased by $210 as a result of the landlord taking each year's um, annual general adjustment increases over the span of the five years. So the new maximum allowable rent for each unit uh, is now $1,610. <clears throat> so while uh, Maria has applied all of the annual general adjustment rent increases, um, her utility and management costs have increased. So now Maria's expenses comprise 34% of Maria's income instead of 30%. So to calculate the current year net operating income, we multiply the new rent of $610 by the four rental units times 12 months to arrive at 77,280. Now the annual expenses have increased to comprise 34% of income, which equates to $26,275. Now when you subtract the, uh, her expenses, from her income, uh, you get a the current year net operating income, again, which is income minus expenses, um, and, and that equals $51,005. So in order for Maria to maintain a fair return, um, current year net operating income must be equal to or greater than their than her base year net operating income. So let's compare the two now. In 2015, the net operating income, in other words, uh, income minus expenses, um, was 47,040. In 2020, it uh, the net operating income was $51,005. So is the landlord maintaining a fair return? What about inflation? So again, we have to look to inflation to determine that. <clears throat> so um, the fair net operating income, again, is the base year net operating income that has been adjusted by inflation or the consumer price index since the base year. In this hypothetical example, Maria's situation, the consumer price index or inflation increased by 15%. Therefore, the fair net operating income um, is now uh, of 47,040 increased by 15% um, for a total of 54,096. So to receive a fair return, the landlord should receive an annual net operating income of 54,096. Because uh, expenses have increased uh, 
to 34 percent uh, from 47,040 to uh, 51,000 five dollars since 2015, Maria's monthly net operating income has increased by less than the percentage increase in the consumer price index. Now the hearing examiner has determined that the fair net operating income is 54,096. That is a $3,091 difference from the current year net operating provide the landlord with a net operating income that generates a fair return, the hearing examiner determines each unit may receive up to a $64 increase in the maximum allowable rent. That's a total of $256 for all four units. The next step would be for the hearing examiner to check to see how much of a percentage the increase will result in for each tenant. In this example, the adjustment in the maximum allowable rent would result in a 4% rent increase for each tenant. Now the board has capped annual rent increases um, for um, fair return uh, petitions at 15%, which would phase in, uh, that 15% would phase in on a yearly basis um, and that would be based on the percentage change in the maximum allowable rent in order to prevent rent shock for the tenants. So there are some cases uh, where the base year net operating income requires adjustment. And that would be if rents weren't based uh, rents during the base year were not based on general market conditions. Now recall that the base year presumes that the rents landlords chose to charge in a year free from rent control provided landlords a fair return on their investment as the rents that were charged were based on general market conditions. This presumption holds true where the rents charged were based on general market conditions. However, there are those instances where the rents that were charged or expenses incurred prior to the enactment of rent control were not based on general market conditions. For instance, rents charged to a close family, friend, or family member may not have been set on general market conditions, but rather on a special relationship the landlord shared with the close friend or family member. Uh, maybe the landlord uh, give a friend a deal on a rental unit because they share a very close relationship um, and they decide to charge rents based on that relationship rather than general market conditions. In that instance, the rent charge would not be based on general market conditions. And subsequently, the presumption that the rents being received during the base year uh, provided the landlord a fair return may not be applicable. To be clear, the phrase rents charged based on general market conditions does not stand for the proposition that rents charged must reflect market rate rents for the base year presumption to hold true. Indeed, the courts have been clear and consistent in determining that landlords do not have a right to have their base year rent adjusted merely by showing that the base rent is below market. In other words, one does not look to the amount of rent charge to determine whether rents were set based on general market conditions. Rather, one looks to the basis by which the rents were charged, whether the rents charged were based on general market conditions or other conditions that would constitute what are known as exceptional circumstances. So <clears throat> where a landlord believes that the base year uh, did not provide a fair return, rent board regulations permit landlords to present evidence to rebut the presumption that the base year net operating income provided a fair return. Now, there are two avenues by which a landlord may rebut the base year presumption. The first 
is the um, uh, if the landlord's operating expenses in the base year were unusually high or low in comparison to other years. The second is if the gross income during the base year was disproportionately low due to exceptional circumstances. Since the net operating income in the gross uh, uh, is the gross income minus expenses, the aforementioned avenues are components to the net operating income and consequently an adjustment in either expenses or income will have an overall impact in the net operating income. So let's look at what are considered exceptional circumstances in the base year. Landlords may rebut the presumption um, by de demonstrating that the gross income in the base year was disproportionately low due to exceptional circumstances. This provision establishes a two-part analysis. First, to rebut the, the base year presumption that a landlord was receiving a fair return, a landlord must demonstrate that an exceptional circumstance served as the basis of setting rents. This is consistent with court rulings that have held uh, that landlords do not have a right to have their base rents adjusted merely by showing that the base rent is below market. Second, to rebut the base year presumption, a landlord must establish that because the rents were charged based on exceptional circumstances, the gross income or rents charged in the base year were disproportionately low. So um, in determining whether the gross income in the base year was disproportionately low, the hearing examiner must consider the following factors. The first is if the gross rental or gross income during the base year was lower than it might have been because some residents were charged reduced rent. Second, would be if the gross income during the base year was significantly lower than normal because of the destruction of the premises and or temporary eviction for construction or repairs. The hearing examiner would also look at the pattern of rent increases in the years prior to the base year and whether those increases reflected increases in the consumer price index. The hearing examiner would also look at a base period rents and whether they were disproportionately low in comparison to the base rents of comparable apartments in the city. And the hearing examiner may also look at other exceptional circumstances. The, exa the hearing examiner has discretion to afford uh, any given factor, any above mentioned given factor, but must analyze each factor to determine uh, its applicability regardless of whether those uh, factors were raised by the landlord or not. Now, if the landlord successfully demonstrates <clears throat> that the landlord set base year rents based on exceptional circumstances and that the resulting rents were disproportionately low, the landlord is entitled to an adjustment in their base year gross income. That adjustment is reflected by artificially increasing the rents reported in the base year, which, which results in a higher base year net operating income. The hearing examiner has the discretion to decide how much, how such um, adjustments in the base year rents occurs but all evidence, evidence relied upon to adjust the base year rents must be reasonable and substantiated by the evidence contained in the record. So let's look at an example um, calculation uh, that involves exceptional circumstances. 
Now consider a situation where a landlord's um, MNOI petition demonstrates a base year gross income of $12,000 and expenses of $6,000. The resulting base year net operating income would be $6,000. Within that same petition, it's determined that the current year gross income is $17,400 and expenses are $6,000. Resulting current year net operating income would be $11,400. Comparing the current year net operating income to the base year, one subtracts 6,000 from 11,400, which results in a positive of 5,400. It would appear that the landlord is receiving a fair return because not only has the landlord maintained the base year net operating income of $6,000 in the current year, they have exceeded it by $5,400. Now suppose the landlord presents evidence that they only rented to close friends and family members and charged low rents because they wanted to give their family members a deal. Assuming that the basis for setting rents satisfies the exceptional circumstance prong and that the set rents in the base year were disproportionately low, the landlord would be entitled to an adjustment in the base year gross income or rent. Using the best evidence available, the hearing examiner would determine base year rent amounts that were set based on general market conditions and make an adjustment in the landlord's base year rents to reflect those rents set based on general market conditions. Again, this does not mean the base year gross rents are adjusted to reflect rents, market rents in the base year. Rather, it means that rents are adjusted to reflect rents in other comparable apartments that were set based on general market conditions. Rents set on general market conditions may not reflect market rents, as the effects of general market conditions differ from neighborhood to neighborhood, bearing on the rental value of the rental units in a particular neighborhood. For instance, general market conditions would yield a different rental value in Richmond's Iron Triangle neighborhood as compared to Point Richmond. Now, once the hearing examiner has made a determination as to the rents that were set based on general market conditions, the hearing examiner adjusts the landlord's base year rents to reflect those based on general market conditions. Returning to the hypothetical, Assume that the average base year rents charged based on general market conditions were $1,500. The hearing examiner would then substitute $1,500 times 12 months to determine the base year income. The result would be that the base year net operating income changes from $6,000, um, in other words, the 12,000 base year gross income minus $6,000 in expenses, to $12,000, and that number comes from $18,000 base year gross income minus $6,000 in expenses. Comparing the new base year net operating income of $12,000 to the current net operating income of $11,400, the landlord is no longer receiving a fair return on their investment, but is $600 below maintaining their base year net operating income. As a result, the landlord is entitled to a rent increase. Now, there are some instances, oftentimes, actually not just some, but in many cases, um, landlords do not have base year rent information or expense information. Um, that's often the result of um, buying a property um, and not receiving uh, the, the, the new owner, not receiving uh, income uh, and expense data from the previous landlord. Now, there have been um, 
many comments made by my landlord regarding why the base, why we use the base here, and what, um, what if you're a new owner and you don't have base here information? Um, base the base year is presumed to have provided the landlord a fair return because rents were set prior to the knowledge of rent control. In other words, they were based on general market conditions. Of particular importance are expenses and income. Now, income is easier to project since when you buy uh, property, you will have the rent history generally and expenses on hand. Um, excuse me, you'll have the rent, his, uh, rent income history. However, expenses, um, on the other hand, can be much more difficult to um, receive. Um, it's also important to realize that as the years pass, um, as long as you haven't done capital improvements or incurred major expenses uh, and major increases in expenses, you'll, you'll be receiving a fair return as vacancies uh, that occur allow rents to be reset to market. Um, so there is a regulation uh, that does allow uh, landlords to uh, project uh, the base year operating expenses in the absence of actual data. And so if the landlord does not have the base year operating expenses, uh, the regulations say that it shall be presumed, presumed that operating expenses increased by the percentage increase in CPI between the base year and the current year. And this presumption is subject to the exception that specific operating expenses shall be adjusted by other amounts when alter, alternate percentage adjustments are supported by a preponderance of evidence. Um, for example, uh, such as uh, data re related to uh, changes in um, utility rates. So many uh, property owners ask, what about capital improvements and how do they impact um, the MNOI, um, any potential increase that I, I would receive through uh, the MNOI petition? First, it's important to know that capital improvements are expenses, so they are counted towards the landlord's operating expenses in the year they uh, were incurred. The only difference is that they are to an increase in interest as measured by the primary mortgage survey plus 2%. So in fact, as an expense, you get the benefit of an interest rate bump. Now the cost uh, itself plus interest um, must be amortized, which means it must be spread out over a number of years to lessen the impact the pass-through would otherwise have on the regulations um, related to capital improvements include a chart and essentially what you do is you take your capital improvement expenses and you divide it by the amortization period. The resulting number is what is included in your expense sheet. Now, if you're actually entitled to uh, a rent increase as a result of capital improvements, um, after the amortization period is over, the rent increase will decrease by the amount um, contributable to the capital improvement. Now, the rent ordinance um, does require that the uh, improvement, the capital improvement, be distinguishable from ordinary repair, replacement, and maintenance. And the improvement must be necessary to bring the property into compliance or maintain compliance with applicable local code requirements affecting health and safety. And uh, to qualify for a capital improvement increase, um, the direct cost must be uh, at least $250 uh, or more per affected unit. Now, landlords are allowed to submit 
capital improvement petition expenses in an anticipated way. So uh, landlords can come in and submit a petition with their anticipated capital improvement expenses. Um, the hearing examiner will review uh, the anticipated uh, expenses and tell the landlord, based on the current numbers uh, that are presented, uh, whether um, they will be entitled to an improvement, a capital improvement increase or not. Um, when the landlord is finished with the capital improvement, um, they would come back to the rent program and submit the petition, uh, the, final, uh, the completed petition for maintenance of net operating income. And if all things remain equal, you will receive an MNOI increase. Now, um, in terms of uh, one, one final note about capital improvement increases, um, it's important to know that any unit that has received a vacancy rent increase uh, pursuant to civil code section 1954.53, also known as the Costa Hawkins Rental Act, within one year prior to the fair return application shall be ineligible for a rent increase for the portion of any rent increase based on the cost of the proposed capital improvement. And that concludes the presentation. Um, I thank everybody for um, uh, listening to this presentation. Hopefully it was informative. I encourage any um, property owner who wants to consider um, filing an MNOI petition to uh, contact one of our rent program services analysts at 510-234-RENT. Uh, or, our, or email us at rent at ci.richmond.ca.us. Um, and of course, I also encourage all property owners to um, visit our website at www.richmondrent.org to learn more about your rights and to make sure that you are full compliance with the rent ordinance. And with that, um, thank you very much. <laughs>